Uh, thank you for that welcome. Can I um, also acknowledge that we're on uh, Wurundjeri, Wurrung land uh, and acknowledge their elders past and present, but most importantly their ongoing custodianship uh, and sovereignty of this place. Um, it's a great joy uh, for me to be here this afternoon. Um, and to, like most of us do, cringe when people read our bios, as I'm about to do from my two colleagues um, on the stage uh, with me. Um, but I'm a proud uh, Dungari man. Our country is uh, on the Maclay River on the mid-north coast of New South Wales. It stretches from the New England Ranges around Walker uh, down to the Pacific Coast at Crescent Head. Um, and I um, uh, also have connections to the Biripai people in Taree and Gutung speakers up into Gloucester and the Upper Hunter. Um, uh, joining me this afternoon for this session on listening to the voices of First Nations people, uh, First Nations communities about putting families at the centre, which uh, uh, attempts, I think, or will well, not, only, not only attempt, will deliver um, consideration of the conference theme, but from a First Nations perspective with First Nations lenses over that question of uh, how to put the voices of First Nations communities at the centre of uh, what we do. Um, and it's no secret to anybody in this room, um, and indeed it should be no secret to anybody in the country, that that impetus to put our mob at the centre of policy and practice concerning us has been uh, the subject of decades of activism, decades of leadership. Uh, and I'm reminded, when I talk about that, the words of Arnie Pat Anderson, who says that people, th non-Indigenous people think that we just sat around and waited for people to give us stuff on a platter. Um, and if any of you know Arnie Pat Anderson, she followed it up with a very firm and a, you know, lots of finger pointing. Uh, we have nothing that we have not fought for ourselves and is not the product of our own agency. Um, and so this theme reflects that. But of course, there are structural and there are methodological issues that go uh, along with giving effect to that. Um, and I'm reminded of that one phrase uh, from the Uluru Statement of the Heart about its intent, and that is uh, in 2017 or 2018, I think 2017, uh, we asked to be heard and this question of voice. And by that, I absolutely don't mean uh, the structural issue of our voice but how does our voice permeate all that we do? And so the panel members uh, that I have with me this afternoon, uh, to my immediate right, Catherine Little. Catherine is the Chief Executive Officer of SNAKE, the National Voice for Our Children. She's an Aranda literature woman from Central Australia and has been a leading advocate in upholding the rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in national, regional, at a national, regional and a local level. Uh, Catherine has held senior management positions in First Nations organisations, including First Nations Media, which is, I think, where we had our, probably our first engagement, uh, Jarwin Indigenous Corporate Partnerships, as well as within the Northern Territory Education Department, the ABC and NITV SBS. She's a journalist by trade, uh, so you can imagine that makes me trying to facilitate and ask really intelligent uh, insightful questions, uh, uh, somewhat of a challenge, <laughs> but I'll give it a crack. Um, uh, but a journalist by trade, her motivation has always been to drive change that leads to positive outcomes and options for First Nations people. Um, and I'm going to let her tell you a bit about her career background, so I'm going to end the bio recitation there, but simply say welcome. Would you welcome Catherine Little? Craig, and I'll double check. Is my microphone working? Doesn't sound like it is. Any chance? It working yet? No? Yes? Yes? All right. There it goes. Awesome. I have a very soft voice, and, and as Craig said, I always find that bio a bit um, in, in, in terminology that all Aboriginal people understand a shame job. Um, <laughs> but it was a lovely introduction, so, so I do thank you for it. Um, and, uh, and, and you're going to have to bear with me for a little while. I am a bit of a storyteller, so I, I am going to tell you a bit of a story. Um, as, as Craig has said, you know, I am I'm the CEO of Snake. I pinch myself every time I say that because I cannot believe this, this incredible organisation supported by these amazing 
um, communities picked me. Uh, to this day, I sort of wonder what was going wrong? <laughs> but they did it and, and, and it's been an incredible privilege. Um, it's also really important for me to um, acknowledge that I'm a long, long way away from home. Um, as, as Craig said, I'm from the Aranda Luruja mob, so we belong to the central regions. And um, it is really important for me to acknowledge that I am a visitor uh, here on the lands of the Kulin Nation. Um, I, I pay homage to this beautiful, beautiful country and the work of the ancestors and the leaders from this country, those who are still with us, uh, I'm sorry, those who aren't uh, still with us and those who have passed, um, I've, uh, I recognise your stories. Um, I recognise the mob from all the other nations, our brothers and our sisters, our cousins, our aunties, our grannies and our grandpas. I thank you for your presence. I, I swear to you, in rooms like this, I feel it. Um, I also acknowledge everyone else who's taken a bit of time out of their day to, to stop in and have a listen to what we've got to say. Um, now, while, um, as I said, I'm, I'm pretty good at talking, but I cannot speak for this country. Um, and while I can't speak for this country, I can say I am in awe of these fantastic landmarks that we are surrounded by, um, the rivers and the hills, um, those things that belong to its creators, um, those awe-inspiring formations that define boundaries and tell us of how we need to care for this country and, more importantly, if we care for this country, how it cares for us. Where I come from, the country looks pretty different, actually. Uh, on my grandfather's country, we'll, we'll talk about that one, Mbantua, Alice Springs. Um, the sand is red, nothing like what you see here. The earth um, is coarse, and if you listen, you can hear it crunch. Um, our gum trees, many of them which are hundreds and hundreds of years old, appear pure silver in the night, standing like ghosts. Many of them represent our ancestors and important sites that spoke to how we care for our country and how we are responsible for each other. In the middle of the town stands uh, a massive tree uh, and it's one that my grandpa used to talk about with his you know, face full of pride and he'd say to me, my granddaughter, that is my tree. And understanding what that means in English is a bit difficult because it sounds like ownership, but it isn't. It talks to responsibility, but it was his tree. Um, just down the road from that, I don't know if you've ever been to Alice Springs, but you go down the mall and you turn left and there's this tree surrounded by a building. That tree is where my grandmother Mary was born, or my great-grandmother Mary was born, and it's a women's site because it's a birthing tree. Two separate laws, both equal. Um, on my country, when the sun rises, these trees, they change colour. So that same sun that turns these trees to this incredible gold will make our ranges glow. Um, and as those rays come up, they erase the stories that are told to us by the night and they give way to these new narrators. Um, some of those narrators are our rangers, right? And these rangers uh, are the bodies of our ancestors. Our ancestors, the caterpillars, they fell during war protecting, this, protecting that country. Um, and it stands as this reminder to anyone coming into Mbandawa land that the people behind these ancestors are protected and cared for. So be prepared for battle. Um, they also talk to us uh, about the hills. So if you've, again, if you've ever been to Alice Springs, we have these more gentle hills. Because they're more gentle in shape, they re represent our women. And these stories, much like the incredible warriors, they tell us stories that talk about loyalty and safety and the importance of family. Um, whilst there are other landmarks that will talk to us and tell us about the pain of separation and disconnection and what might happen to you if you lose sight of your culture and you lose the ability to look after your families. These stories, believe it or not, even though we still talk to them, are actually in my country told in a language that's no longer spoken, but we know them and we know them intuitively. And they still are readable to anyone who approaches and in reading them, what they actually do, well, it sounds like an awesome story, what they're actually doing is they're laying down the policies and the laws and the behaviours or programs that belong to that country. It is an incredible framework that is accompanied by an implementation guide, as you'd know it today, that tells you how to turn up to that country, how you approach it, but not only when you get there, who you reach out for, for help. We don't just leave you to work out how to navigate our country yourselves. We offer you that support. Um, today, you'd call that component of this a welcome to country. So they're the people that will guide you through this. Um, and the person approaching is the person that gives the acknowledgement, tells you, I don't really belong here. I need some help. Central to all of this, of course, is care, 
family and protection. It is critical and underlies everything that our law frameworks tell us and, and support us to develop and reinforce. Um, it doesn't exist in discrete departments and it isn't discussed in forums but rather it is the responsibility of everyone and it is shared with us through our families from the time we are born. There is no guessing what the impact of not following these stories is. We know it from the time we are born. It is integral to everything we do. So this incredible way of knowing and doing and being is really what led me to SNAKE. Um, and while told using a different framework, it represents exactly the topic that we're talking about today. And that is making sure that Aboriginal families are at the centre of decision making from direct practice all the way through to the highest levels of policy making. Our stories and way of doing were, uh, were often interrupted with disastrous um, impact and I'm, I'm sure I don't need to tell any of you what those disastrous impacts have been on our mob. Our communities, as Craig pointed to, they understood that we needed new ways to communicate, to design, to teach and to learn. And this required a new tool and those tools came in the shape of things like peak bodies. Um, as as um, Craig alluded to, a lot of our peaks have been around for a long time. Snake is one of the oldest at more than 40 years. Um, it was designed as the National Peak Body for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. And it was designed to work with all levels of government, advocating for what we know keeps our kids safe and our families strong, and all of us connected to this amazing culture so that we can walk into rooms like this, knowing that in these rooms, more mob of our sit and our ancestors stand behind us. With a 40 year footprint, in working to support our families and our organisations and pushing for their voices and experiences to be heard, we're very proud to say we are one of the nation's oldest peaks. We continue to do this work and our communities continue to ask us to do this work because we know that, as you would know, Australia has a terrible track record with our families and our children. It started bad and it is getting worse in many, many circumstances. Um, I'm sure you've all read the papers, so you'd know that we have some widening gaps. I hate that word gap, and where I come from, people mix that up. You know, it means very little to people on the ground. But where, they, where I come from, they mix it up and they think that is the gap that you come through, that gap represented by our ancestors. So part of our job is to work with government to help them understand the impact and the value of the Aboriginal community controlled sector its incredible resilience and the strength of Aboriginal families and to make sure that our voices are up front and in the centre of all decisions that impact on us. Because we know that when our families and when our communities are not at the centre and Aboriginal people are not at the decision making table, things just go wrong, right? It just goes wrong and it's, it's, it's common sense. We need to be in these rooms. Um, in the past, despite this incredible history and, and our resilience, systems have been built without any involvement for Aboriginal people. But now we know that we have a few things coming on, right? We've got this brand new government. Um, we've got some commitments already coming through relating to a voice, but we also know we've got the national agreement on closing the gap. Now the national agreement is significantly different to just closing the gap because the national agreement is talking about how we influence policy and implementation and, and how it might look different and how it can work different if we're actually at the table. It's an incredibly strong agreement because what it talks to is priority reforms. It moves away from targets and says targets are useless if you don't change the way you're working with us. Um, so it talks to things like shared decision making between governments and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Not co-designed, shared decision making. It talks about investing in our community controlled organisations. So those organisations that are nuanced for the communities and built for the communities with people that understand what is special and unique and where the strengths and opportunities are in those communities. We're starting to see a couple of the fruits um, come along on this journey with us and, and we're certainly getting a lot more success at working with government agencies in ways that we never thought would happen even though we hoped for it. Um, but there's still a really, really long way to go on because we know that it's yet to hit the ground. Um, and we know, as I've said, policy means very, very little to our families and our communities who are just going about their lives. An example of this, of course, is that our children continue to be overrepresented over in the child protection system. 
Um, I hate talking about statistics because I'm always reminded that these are all kids and they're all families, so I hate the numbers. But I know we can't have the conversation without the numbers because they tell us an important story. And they tell us a story about policy failure in child and family welfare. So in June last year, there were more than 22,000 of our kids in out-of-home care, um, all of them on third-party orders. 79% of those children are permanently living away from their birth parents and their families. The system is absolutely failing our families. Our children are 10 times more likely to enter out-of-home care compared to non-Indigenous children. And when we enter the system, our kids are often let down because their cultural rights aren't applied. Their connections to country are severed or not supported. Of those children in out-of-home care, only 41% are placed with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander carers, and it's a percentage that is dropping every year. And in some of our states and territories, we're actually seeing a trajectory towards more permanency. We're also seeing an increased use of adoption orders to solidify placements of children away from their families, which again severs these incredible vital connections and this incredible strength that we bring with us as Aboriginal people. These decisions to remove our children from our families about who a child should live with are often being made in ways that are not consistent with the five elements of the child placement principle. This principle designed by our mob in recognition of what our mob needed. The principle is all about making sure that families and communities are at the centre and at the table and that they are able to remain connected to culture and family. So there's a lot of um, people who like to talk about how we might solve this. Um, for our families, but often the only people missing from those rooms when they're talking about how to solve the problem from our families is the families themselves. There is so much more that we can do to support and strengthen families before they interact with the tertiary end of child protection systems. And that starts right back at how we invest into the early years, education and care, and those early intervention supports for families who are experiencing vulnerabilities. Um, and of course, I'm sure you all know the importance of early childhood. Um, because we know that this is where we can change things up, we know this is where we can make a difference, and we know that it's a key opportunity for us to work with government, particularly since the new government has made new commitments to childcare. Um, so it's something we're looking forward to seeing some really awesome large-scale reform and investment in. And we need to make this reform count. This is a moment in time. We need to set Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children up for success, because like all kids, they have the right to equitable access to these um, services. Um, we know that our children deserve care and strong development, uh, developmental outcomes. I don't think I need to reinforce that with any of you in this room. I'm sure you're all allies. So I, I enjoy being in rooms like this because I know all of you can help us achieve these things. The current early years landscape, as you'd know, needs significant improvement. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children are genuinely not afforded the same opportunity to access the services of non-Indigenous children's children. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children actually only attend at 69% of the rate um, that non that non-Indigenous children do. Um, these numbers in out of home care, uh, sorry, in of hours of childcare, are even less. Reflecting this, we know that we're well off track in meeting targets to close the gap, and that target is fifty to see 55% of our children developmentally on track against the Australian Early Development Consensus by 2031. As we know, we've got this new government uh, and we know that we need to now say, OK, we've got these things, how do you now put us at the centre? How do we know? How do we know we're going to get there? How are we going to use these new tools? And we know that we can design a new funding model. I'm just going to hint that one. Funding, new funding model, right? How do we get that one done so that we can turn this situation around? We know that mainstream funding models do not work for our mob. We know that they do not respond to the needs of our communities. So we need funding opportunities that enable the strengths of our communities and make childcare accessible and genuinely work on the complex issues that many of our families are dealing with. Because we know for our children and our families to fully engage in early education and care, we need a different approach. So it's on the back of the national agreement and change in government approaches that SNAKE is advocating for seven reform priorities which focus on investment in prevention and early support services for families through a new national program 
for Aboriginal and community controlled led integrated family support services. And I'm sure a few of you in the room are familiar with how awesome these services are. Um, once upon a time, some of them were funded, but there was a funding shift and that shows you how vulnerable they are. Many of them went down and the space to create more disappeared. We know that when we listen to the stories from our families of how services go above and beyond to give support to their communities, we know that we're on track. Um, just recently we heard um, a really heartbreaking story actually about an older woman that had been observed living under a bridge um, and she's on the outskirts of town. Now there were a couple of ways you could approach this. She had a little kid with her, you could have reported her to services and said there's a problem, but it was the childcare centre that actually worked it out and they saw her and they reached out and they said what can we do to help and it turned out that she'd been um, escaping domestic violence and, and had, no, had nowhere to live. And the childcare service said, come in, come into the centre and linked her up using all its tools and resources to housing and to support and found a home for that family and, and were able to help that grandmother understand how to use the early childcare system, how to apply for support. It was, it, it's quite remarkable. And we often wonder what would happen if someone else had come across this family. This is work that isn't funded. This is work that our community controlled organisations take on because it's the work that needs to be done because we know that it has to be done differently. So what we're calling for also is, is more national accountability. So we know if we get a voice that increases our national uh, accountability, but we also know, and this is reinforced by the fact that I've got the awesome Natalie Lewis sitting next to me, that the roles of our commissioners are fundamental and the roles of our state-based commissioners will be enhanced if we can get a national commissioner, a mechanism to keep governments accountable. So right now, I'm just gonna reinforce um, that we have unprecedented commitments to change the way governments work with us, unprecedented commitments. We know that with the right support and investment, we have the opportunity to change a narrative of gaps to one that celebrates our families' strengths and resilience, one that celebrates the expertise and capabilities of our organisations, which is recognised through government investing in Aboriginal-led initiatives and the transfer of decision-making power back to our communities and putting our families back into the centre where their voices belong. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Catherine. Lots and lots of uh, grist for lots and lots of mills. I was looking around when you mentioned funding models to see if I could spy the DSS people, um, <laughs> particularly Secretary Griggs, but he may not be in the room, um, uh, a co old colleague of mine. Um, but we'll come back to some of that because we'll, I want to probe some of that with some questions in a moment. Um, I will just remind people there's another room that's watching us. Um, and uh, I keep looking at my phone, not because um, I'm getting bored, but because there's an app that questions will come in on. So I'm trying to do three things, uh, uh, manage the conversation, manage two devices, um, and reflect on some notes that I made at a conversation that uh, panel members and I had uh, some time ago. But let's hear from our, uh, our second panel member this afternoon, Natalie Lewis, uh, who is was appointed as Commissioner for the Queensland Family and Child Commission in May of 2020. Uh, Natalie is a Gamilaroi woman and brings uh, with her a wealth of experience and knowledge from her distinguished over 20 year career in youth justice, child and family services and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs. Uh, she works with a strong and renewed focus on the systemic and structural issues uh, dis disproportionately affecting uh, First Nations children. Previously, Natalie held the role of Chief Executive Officer with, uh, I'm going to get this right, oh gosh. The Queensland Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Child Protection Peak. <laughs> Limited. That's <laughs> <laughs> what it says. Um, as Commissioner, uh, Natalie uh, drives change to better the safety and wellbeing and interests of children and young people, including those in the child protection system. Would you welcome Natalie Lewis this afternoon? Thank you. Okay, I think the mic's working, but I've got a loud voice anyway. Um, just as a Gamilaroi Yenna, I'm a guest on this country and I want to acknowledge 
the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation um, as the traditional custodians of this place. Um, but I also really just want to acknowledge that in, in this place there is such exceptional leadership and such forward thinking, um, you know, things that are happening here in terms of treaty. Um, you know, it is the birthplace of snake. Um, there are individuals and communities of care that operate in this space here that we look to, you know, for other parts of the country about, um, you know, how to make a, a positive difference. And, um, and you know, I've had the pleasure in the past of, of being involved with snake and, um, and Catherine, you are absolutely where you're supposed to be. And I think you've done an exceptional <laughs> job. Um, I am currently a commissioner with the Queensland Family and Child Commission, so I would be remiss of me not to give a shout out to the staff that are here and to our incredible youth advocates um, who have come down here to join us. Um, hopefully next time we all get together, um, there'll be many more young people um, that are part of these conversations. Um, I think that's incredibly important. Um, we, we do a really good job of talking about young people, but um, probably need to improve a lot in the space where we talk to them. So, um, I, um, you're so positive. I love, I love the way you frame things. And, um, and I'm always, you know, I, I just, you're so uplifting. And, and then I get to come in and be the misery guts, you know, that, um, you know, that talks about things that have, you know, really been, that I, I certainly have observed and struggled with um, across um, my work in this field. But I did have the opportunity this morning to go and listen to the presentation of um, Children's Ground. And what really caught my attention was the name of their presentation was at the center. Um, it, it, sorry, it questioned the idea of being at the center and instead proposed the importance of us leading. And that distinction, that, that is a really critical point of difference. If we want to move beyond this incrementalist approach towards reform, to truly achieve transformational change. Um, they also had this practice principle, which was about assume and celebrate ability. And I thought, damn, what a difference. Because I've noticed over the years that that pathway to reform always starts with this assumed lack of ability or capability for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So I don't think I've read an action plan that hasn't included the very important action of increasing the capability or the capacity of Aboriginal people or organisations. Um, and, and there's, you know, a talk, I won't go into it in detail, but there's this talk that Noel Pearson um, did once around that soft bigotry of low expectations. And um, it blows my mind that George W. Bush was the one who first said that, because the man struggles to put a sentence together. But I think what's really, really important about that is that we have earned the right to be seen as equals. Our thought leadership, the innovation that happens in our communities, the way we have been able to establish and preserve communities of care for our children is exceptional. And so I feel like as much, you know, as, as, much as we've done a lot of work um, you know, to sit at, at the same tables and to have those conversations. I really just want to point out that I think that this low bar of the concept of co-design, other than sort of evoking that spontaneous eye roll, um, <laughs> but it impose, automatically imposes limits on the level of participation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, it sort of relegates us to this role of partner, and I don't mind being partner. I really, really, I don't. But that sometimes that partnership is kept in check by the unspoken, but fiercely defended power imbalance that exists between our people and our organisations and the system and its actors. So we can co-design all we like, but we've got to pay equal attention to, to deconstructing that power imbalance um, because you know inevitably what ends up happening is that what we co-design has to actually exist and operate within a construct that is fundamentally at odds with our worldview and with our aspirations. So um, when that approach fails to deliver, that change that we sort of all hope for, um, you know, it breaks my heart because it's always pointed back at this must be about the lack of capacity or capability of Aboriginal people. 
So I just want you to let you know that that disappointment is debilitating and what we can do actively, individually and as organisations, as decision makers, to recalibrate that power imbalance, respect the thought leadership of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people at the table as your peers, as your equals. Trust that we're actually going to stay the course. There's no one more invested in a positive outcome for our kids than us. So I think that um, that's, that's something I think that everyone can seek comfort in. We've not disappeared. Snake has not def definitely not disappeared. Um, and there are many, many people that have fronted up, not just at conferences like this, but at decision-making tables that some of us don't know even exist, and they fiercely advocate for our children. We need to back them up. Um, <clears throat> all right. You want me to go on? OK, I can, balance, I can balance it up a little. Um, let me see. I, one thing I want to say, because I have sat at some of those tables, and I still do. I think that I can tell you that progress is made when our partners are comfortable with being quiet, when they respect that there are some matters a bit about which they're not the experts, um, and that we're not looking to them for the answers. Um, I think that sometimes recognising that you're not best placed to speak but to listen intently and then to act on our advice. Um, even if it doesn't fit into your beloved framework neatly um, or if it doesn't quite fit with this concept of the perfect system, um, I think we can resist the urge to try and shave those rough edges off, you know, the advice that's often given. Um, I think that we can actually make a change and I, and I really think that there are live examples and in the National Framework Protecting Australia Children in the last iteration, okay, well we can all sit there and say, oh God, we kind of went backwards in a lot of ways. I did see these glimpses during the process of the development of action plans and in um, the things that followed, the, the, the platforms that were laid for us to move into this next phase um, and there are people I think some that are in this room, who when I described about people being comfortable not being the experts and curating those spaces for people like me to have a voice. Um, they are in this room, their careers haven't died because of their you know, willingness to accept that they're not the expert. Um, but people like Daryl Higgins, um, like Stella Conroy is in this room, um, Annette from the Parenting Research Centre. There are people in here that we all respect as leaders in their field um, and who are humble enough to recognise that sometimes other people know better. So um, I just want to acknowledge those people too because that, that's what a real partnership looks like. Um, now, right, let me see, sorry. <laughs> Just in terms of, I know we've got some researchers in here and, um, and I think that, that research is like absolutely critical, right, to identify inequity and injustice. But too often we're the subjects, not the solutions that are offered in, in that body of research. And that body of research can be fraught with this thing called hazardous good intentions, right? So inevitably if where you land problematises Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and families, um, that perpetuates a narrative of disadvantage and that supports those, um, it supports that, um, that focus on us being something that needs to be fixed. Um, but it would be really great to see a shift in the body of research away from the conditions of the oppressed towards examining the tools and the structures of oppression that create and maintain those conditions of disadvantage and injustice for our children and families. Um, so I think that that's never more um, critical than with those families that are within the force field of child protection systems. Um, and I think that is where our greatest responsibility lies in terms of advancing research that tells the story of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander aspiration, but also of the types of solutions that we are capable of delivering in this system. So that, that thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, so feverishly taking notes, although I kind of feel a bit obtuse doing that because I think both of our speakers could not have been clearer about the challenges and the opportunities. And I've got to say, as the head of an, uh, an institution that has the word studies on the end of its name, 
um, and looking at the new head of another institution that has the word studies on the end of its name. Uh, Natalie, your challenge about the nature and the focus of research related uh, to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in, in the main um, is really important. And that shift from problematising us um, and problematising our communities um, and um, that subjectification of us where we, we're the object of study rather than the people leading it and the people asking the, the, the right questions and the systems and the structures within which we work becoming the object of problematisation um, is really important. So thank you uh, for that. Um, both of our um, uh, panel members really emphasise the importance of community controlled organisations and Aboriginal people uh, and communities um, as, our, as central to, to um, this shift in focus, this shift in approach, shift in methodology. If I reflect on my time in the community controlled health sector, one of the things um, that AMS's, uh, ones that I ran and one I'm the chair of now, um, eh, experience is the drain that follows or you know, almost inevitably on a call for us to lead or for a call for us to be in, in the centre. I didn't hear that presentation this morning, but I want to follow it up. Um, and the, the burden of expectation that falls on often small, poorly funded and exhausted organisations to do that. And I wonder if you can reflect on that um, and, and the challenge that that we, we, we all know the challenge that it, it, might, it, it represents to our organisations, but there are people in the room who need to understand that challenge from a funding and a policy framework perspective. I'm happy to jump in because I'm um, hoping that's working. I had a conversation like this just yesterday uh, and I was talking to this amazing um, group, uh, Waminda in New South Wales, and um, they, they, they came up with a, a, a different way of helping families who were at risk of coming into contact with the child protection system and that this program's called Naboo. And uh, they, they're still not sure how they got it through, but they got it through because this, this program was all about decolonising approaches. Um, historically, they'd been funded to deliver best case practice based on international evidence developed somewhere and then brought into Australia, despite the fact that, um, as we've identified, we have more than 80,000 years experience, uninterrupted experience at raising our families and our children in a way that is healthy. Um, so the fact that we don't have that is, is, is quite amazing. Anyhow, so they came up with their own approach. Um, so, and they also, in that own, their own approach, they also ch were able to negotiate what their KPIs would be and what their outcomes would be. So again, they, they, to this day, they pinch themselves and say, we do not know how we got this funding agreement through, but they clearly had someone willing to take a chance on this. So where previously they were told that this is what you had to do, they'd found that children coming into contact with this particular program was still being removed at a rate that their community, as a community controlled organisation said, shame job you mob, you're taking the money and our kids are still leaving. So. Um, they flipped it. They flipped it and said, okay, we're going to take more time to work with our families. We're going to have more contact with our families. So uh, some of that data reflects that for every child they come into contact with, they have at least five family members that they are in regular contact with. And again, this represents our own traditional way of doing and being. Um, and they started pushing the boundaries on how you monitor and evaluate what success looks like. One of the examples that they've recently had a success rate story with involved working with a family for 18 months when the status quo is three months. We expect change of behaviour in our families within three months. I mean, I don't know if you've ever tried going on a diet, but it takes more than three months to get that one right, right? Um, so anyhow, Not there's often. Th absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> However, getting this, getting the movement through for a the correct monitoring evaluation of this pro of this program, so that you can actually reflect what is happening and what is different and how those families have changed, is incredibly difficult because research frameworks are still 
developed elsewhere and then applied as opposed to the community being able to say that is not what research should look like, this is not what you should be looking like. So that's one battle. But the second battle is they're so successful, everyone wants to hear from them constantly. Everyone wants to know what they're doing, but they are actually, that takes time. That takes someone to write your notes, that takes someone to take you out of what you're doing, it takes time to travel and they're finding the burden of being successful crippling. So without additional resources and an easier way to fund this program, because again, like I said, it doesn't fit the boxes. This program, despite its success, does not fit current funding parameters and they're battling to get a second round on it. Um, it is exhausting, despite the fact that everyone wants to hear from them, everyone wants the data, everyone wants to know how they're doing it. Dollars aren't there. And they'll still continue to do the work. <laughs> they'll still continue to do the work. They're awesome. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah, look, I think that one of the, I think you know, one of the most Im important aspects of community control is just is is the recognition of that con this this concept of dual accountability. So you know, normally in that relationship around a funder and a provider, you know, it's just you know, it's. Um, goes back and forth and you know um, your performance is to a set of you know agreed outcomes or agreed outputs or whatever else and I think the thing that sometimes I think it's the strength but it's often by government departments completely underestimated is that the value of a community control organisation is the notion of dual accountability so there is this accountability to community for particular to achieve particular expectations and and so I think where that's been recognised in the formation of things like funding agreements or, um, you know, initiative specifications, you know. Um, I think there's some good examples of that in Queensland where, you know, um, the, the growth of the network of um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Family Wellbeing Services, um, you know, um, puts it with the backing of their member organisations who are all community control providers, um, really influence, had a direct um, direct input into um, setting up those terms, you know, on which they'd operate, the types of um, activities that they'd be undertaking. And they did that knowing that there were going to be a set of expectations from community that they were more concerned about meeting than any milestone that was put on, a, you know, a government service agreement. And I think that that accountability keeps us in check. Um, and helps us to remember who our primary obligation is to, and that's to our kids and families. So, yeah. do, you think, do you think that reflects a fundamental difference in a relational accountability that mm. we have with communities because uh, people who run Aboriginal organisations live in the communities that they provide services to, mm. um, as opposed to the purely transactional ac accountabilities yeah. that are reflected in a funding agreement? Yeah. Um, and I think one of the challenges for those of us who administer programs, or not that I do that now, but um, used to, is to not conflate a funding agreement with a relationship. Um, and, and because that can be tricky. Uh, again, both of you talked about the importance of, uh, in different ways, but the importance of First Nations leadership in a space. Um, and uh, Catherine, you used the phrase, um, set our kids up for success. And it's a bit unfortunate that Ray's not here, Ray Lovett, um, because some of the work that they're doing uh, at ANU is about uh, child wellbeing indexes framed from an Indigenous perspective. Uh, and so I wonder if you, uh, both of you would care to talk about what success looks like. Oh, look, I think, again, this is why you've got to have families at the centre, because families know what success looks like for them. So this is going to change given um, what family it is, what community is, what people want to achieve. But if we, if we look at things like, and, and again, the AEDC, that is the tool that we have to work with because that is the only tool available to us at this point in time. But we know that there are other ways of measuring success for our children, right? We know that our children are multilingual. We know that our children exist between different worlds, which means they come with this incredible amount of emotional and cultural intelligence that's overlooked. Um, we, we don't recognise that our children uh, are born into responsibility. So uh, while non-Indigenous children are born and they're babies, oh, you're lovely little babies, our babies turn up and we say, you're the boss for that tree. 
you're also grandfather of that person, big brother for that person, uncle for that person, and you will be responsible for looking after them. So this happens immediately. So what does that do to our children's development? What successes can be learned from um, enabling children from the moment they're born? Um, we're not looking at those strengths. We're not looking at the fact that um, our children are incredibly enabled and really good at solving problems. Sometimes these, this ability to solve problems can lead, uh, problems can lead to other problems. Um, but I, I, I once heard a story and I thought it was a really interesting way of looking at it. It related to a breakout in the um, juvenile detention facility in Alice Springs. And um, the way the social worker who was talking about it, who had this awesome use of strength-based language said, what they forgot was the amount of talent in that room. Um, <laughs> and so what these kids right, had managed to, to work out was that doors were only locked from the inside. So if you could get up through the air conditioning vent and crawl and drop, it was really easy to unlock the door and let everyone out. Um, so <laughs> while, while that, 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 that particular strength-based story comes from a, a you know, juvenile justice sort of frame, it shows you that even those children that are doing it toughest, right, because you do not come into contact with the juvenile justice system if things are going well in your life. Um, but it shows that there's this incredible ability to solve problems that, again, is not recognised. So how do, you how do you harness that? How do you put that into that practice? Goes, that goes to this fundamental issue of what, what, our, what, what our training or what the training mm. of people predisposes them to see. Mm. Um, uh, and and so there will be some people who look at that story and mm -hmm. kind of go, yep, that speaks to the in, the inherent deviousness um, mm -hmm. of problem solving kids, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. As opposed to what brilliant pro problem solving. Mm -hmm. It's a bit. It, it depends on the, the framework. Absolutely. Um, and 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 Natalie, you talked a lot about that. And I think that's mm -hmm. where the leadership bit mm -hmm. comes in, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I mean, just on that, that point around measurement and stuff like that, I mean, one of, one of the roles, um, each of the commissions is different, like in every jurisdiction, um, but, you know, we're a statutory body, we've got a responsibility for oversight of the child protection system. And, um, you know, I've been there, like, I've been there two years now, and um, it was the accountability bit, bringing some accountability, that was, you know, for me, a big motivator. And, um, and then you kind of look at it and you think, well, I look at the data that's available and I can understand the system churn. Mm -hmm. I know how many kids go in, I know how long they stay for, I know when they go. But I have no clue from the data that's provided about how safe and well children are. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that there's, that's the purpose. If, if you were intervening in the lives of children and families on the basis of them being unsafe, then your purpose is to make them more safe and more well, and I know that's probably very poor grandma. But, um, but on the metrics available, we can't tell that story. And I think what's, um, so rather than sort of going to the system and assuming the system can, you know, can fix this, um, some work that the QSCC did um, was engaging young researchers. So children, young people, young people with a lived experience um, and actually started to work through and help us understand these, these are the metrics that matter. These are the things that tell us if our experience has been one of safety, of love, of connection, and they're the things as, a, as an oversight body that you fellas should be taking into account, you should be paying attention to. Yeah. So that literally, for us, in terms of now moving into what is the monitoring framework, for us as an oversight body of the child protection system in Queensland, they can keep all the data they, you know, that they um, contribute annually. We don't need it because actually young people have told us this is the measure of a successful system. So I think that that's one of those things where we underestimate the capacity of children and young people who have a lived experience in the same way we do of their families. So I think that if we actually can reposition them as experts and actually ask them what does different look like, we start to be able to build systems that we can monitor mm -hmm. to meet their aspirations because they're the same aspirations everyone wants, their children and young people to be safe and well. So um, yeah, anyway, that's just a plug for the Rights Voices Stories work <laughs> from the QFCC if you'd like to have a look at it. Well done, well done. <laughs> and look, I think what's really, and, and underpinning all of that, isn't it, Natalie, is the story the data tells at the moment is the wrong story 
and the way so governments because it's work, the wrong data it's the wrong data so you cannot tell the right story if the data is wrong and as we know policy and funding follows that data so we are responding to the wrong issues because we have not created the right story mm. yeah I don't know what there is to say beyond that. Um, I did have a note about the data story, but we just covered that right there. Um, uh, look, there's, uh, there is an opportunity to ask questions. I'm, I keep observing the, the app, or as we would say, the HAP, uh, and um, there is no one, it keeps telling me no one has asked any questions yet. There's also two microphones here, so we're going to go to um, uh, uh, an, to give you an opportunity to, to um, ask questions of uh, the panel members. So you're going to need to go and stand at the microphone. The microphone's not going to come to you. Um, in the meantime, can I ask Natalie and Catherine, both of you, to think about um, if you were to pick two or three key systemic reforms, like key, key ways you want government to change. Uh, uh, the challenge is going to be two or three. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's, that's the problem. Um, I did, I did, I've got to say, love that phrase, to be c comfortable with being quiet yeah, yeah, that's an awesome um, is a really good one. Yeah. And I'm writing a thesis on public policy and Aboriginal culture. I'm going to steal it, but I will acknowledge you, Natalie. Oh, yeah. um, um, uh, so, but there's a, while, while you think about that, yeah. uh, we'll go to this question over here. Well, actually, if I could interrupt really quickly. <laughs> God, God forbid, hey, God forbid. Anyhow, one of the things, I, 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 we all throw to you. <laughs> Stoke the fire and ask you not to say anything. I was thinking about the starter story, right? I was thinking about the starter story and I was thinking about the worst possible example I could give you. And, and because I spend so much of my time in the closing the gap policy stuff, um, it was on my brain recently when someone said, talked about the fact that when they were first forecasting what, how long it would take to close the gap in incarceration rates. It came up with 98 years, wow. 98 um. years, and everyone just banged their head against a wall. And we were being told that this was, this is what the data says. This is what the data says. And as, as Aboriginal people, we all pushed back and said the data is wrong because the data is based on your understanding of what needs to change in order to change that, as opposed to an Indigenous perspective and Indigenous responses and Indigenous systemic reform that would accelerate that. Because we know where we get um, approaches like what Nat's been talking about, we see system changes and numbers change immediately. But using the current data, that is what it looks like. And I, and I remember when that came out because my granddaughter had just been born. Mm -hmm and the thought that she would be 98 years old before things were different was mm -hmm. horrifying. Yeah. Anyhow, I interrupt. You've got a question. Sorry. I guess my question is around the, um, the, the story that we need to tell, or the questions we need to ask and the data we need to be looking at. I think that there are little micro-projects happening around the country yes. that are rewriting that narrative Correct. and giving families, particularly Aboriginal families, the ability to, to to demonstrate that they are capable and, and able to deliver and participatory and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But how do you get that story out and how do we change that narrative within government to stop collecting the wrong data and point them to the right data? Or how do we collect that data? Yeah, yeah, that, and, and that is the policy reform piece. So it, it starts with the ability to do those micro examples, um, but it doesn't, in isolation it doesn't work. So uh, I guess one of the things that Snake has done, and, and Nat played a, a really big role in, in some of this work, revolves around the Family Matters report. So that was essentially <coughs> saying that the data story for out-of-home care was wrong and that we had no way to get the data out of government. So we needed to create a report that actually monitored what was happening in the states and territories, providing examples of where we were getting great breakthroughs, um, either from a community-led perspective or from a government government perspective and then analysing what was actually going different um, in those regions that was creating that output. Now those sorts of things, an incredible challenge, so again if I stay on child protection for a moment in time and um, move into the child placement principle, so I, I alluded to that before or mentioned it before, these placement principles developed by Aboriginal people from the ground up, This is these are the steps that you need to go through. 
We, we hear um, consistently that, these, that the principle isn't applied properly because people aren't, don't understand how to do it or have no interest in doing it and they tick and flick. So we're, we're pushing consistently to say, you've got to get a better way to measure this. States and territories have signed up to it. It's now five years and you don't have a way to measure this nationally. And, and we get told constantly that that's because different states and territories are in different places, Commonwealth's in a different place, and there's no national definition on what community control is. Then you hear things like there's no it, the problems in keeping the data sets that we need to understand what's happening. Do they breach confidentiality? So there's, there's barrier after barrier after barrier. Now we know that they don't, and we know that there's ways around all of these approaches, but getting everyone on the same page at the same time is a massive push. Um, we know again, we've got new tools coming into play. So one of them um, that Snake will be heavily involved with, um, and Nat as well, through her work um, in the Aboriginal Leadership Group, um, is the policy partnership group that will come online um, for early education and care. And that's where you have the Commonwealth, plus the jurisdictions, plus a number of the peaks, a number of the depth sex, and a number of community members to say, is it working? What's working and how do you make it work better? So that's one of the tools. The commissioners, um, their other tools, a voice um, is, is, a, is another tool. But these things, if we can get them all moving simultaneously, if we can move this moment in time, can shift it, but it will not happen in isolation. But Nat? Yeah. Um I'm kind of blurring, um, I'm blurring the two uh, questions, mm -hmm. but in terms of the key systemic reforms, if we talk about the issue of overrepresentation, um, I think for me there's probably some examples of things that, look, we haven't solved it, but I think we've got the foundations right. Um, I think um, full and faithful implementation of all five elements of the child placement principle across every significant decision, not just placement. If we can get that in place, absolutely that can be transform, um, transformational. Um, I think also when we look at the example in, um, you know, people talk a lot about Victoria and having um, uh, the guardianship provisions in Section 18, um, you know, and they stayed on the books for a long time. Now it's been trialled and now it's working and it's slowly moving guardianship across to um, Aboriginal community controlled organisations. But in Queensland, we have provisions around delegated authority, which means any and all powers and functions of the legislation can be delegated to the CEO of a community-controlled organisation. So, and the important bit about that is that it is centred around the best, the best interests of that individual child. So it's not just this wholesale, here, you fellas now responsible, you take on all the risk and responsibility for a particular function under the Act. It means that when it is in the best interest of a particular child that that decision maker is, the, is an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person instead of the chief executive of the statutory system, that can actually be moved through a delegation instrument. So those things are starting to happen in, in Queensland and I think in, um, there's examples in the Sunshine Coast um, and in Rockhampton where we see like massive shifts, kids that have been in the system for five or six years, you had genograms with four people on it, and you hand over the function around mapping and identification of kin, planning for transition to a community controlled organisation, and within two weeks you've got over 200 people, half of them viable options around kinship for children that have been disconnected for five or six years because that someone could only come up with four people that they were connected to. That is transformation on those are the things that can make a significant difference. And the other thing I would just ask all of you, I think what's really important in the call for, from Family Matters is around the establishment of an independent, dedicated National Commissioner for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and one in every jurisdiction, stressing, independent, unapologetically focused on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and their issues. Because um, if anything, um, I think that the data that we continue to hear, the horror stories, they tell us that that is a crisis. How about we act like it is? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, yeah. And the Family Matters report is an awesome one if you are looking for what policy reform could look like. But you know, we've also talked about things like your investment into your community-controlled organisations, the need mm. for genuine partnership in decision making, um, and and as Nat said, when when we get that, we also say uh, that partnership 
is, isn't about you being the genuine lead. It is about acknowledging that Aboriginal people are the experts. But it also means um, policy reform that would enable the transition of service delivery to our mob uh, and to our services. Because at this point in time, only a fraction of the dollars that go into supporting our children go into our organisations. And yet, if we go back to the data story, the data shows that despite that only being a fraction of the investment, they are the services that get the outcomes. These awful outcomes you're hearing about, they are not our services delivering those numbers. Perfect. Thank you, and uh, really powerful. I, Natalie, I wonder if you can just reflect a little bit further on that, that example about delegated authority. Mm -hmm. uh, because it seems to me you can have a system where that's allowed, um, and if you don't have either the courage or, the, or, mm. or a culture within a, a statutory system mm. to actually make the delegation, mm. um, then it doesn't really matter that it's allowed because <coughs> it will never happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so one of the things I've been looking at um, is the, the thoroughly managerial public sector that we've created over the last 50, 60 years mm. in this country and other Western democracies where the emphasis is on power and control mm -hmm. um, under the heading management. Um, so I, I'd be interested to kind of, if you can reflect on how, what were the things that shifted the appetite of statutory chief executives to make those delegations where they've worked? Yeah, look, you know, I think there's, um, <clears throat> we were really uh, fortunate in Queensland, there's, in, there's this moment almost, you know, where the stars align, mm -hmm. where you had, um, Family Matters, we come out with, the, I think, the first um, roadmap. I don't know, it's a long time ago, but it's still as relevant today as it was back then. Um, but we'd sort of come out with the roadmap. Queensland had started on this trajectory of those numbers worsening, with no real plan in place to do anything um, much different. We just had a, a commission of inquiry, which, you know, um, while there was a great <coughs> chapter dedicated towards Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander issues, um, we all knew at first read that they were never going to, that was never going to deliver the change that we wanted. And I think it was just this op this moment where we had this, the solution or an option to a really big problem that government was acknowledging was a problem, and we had people in positions with courage that um, just knew that there was no option anymore, we needed to do better. And, um, and so that Family Matters roadmap then became the basis for the Our Way strategy in Queensland, which is the first generational strategy to address over-representation. And so um, delegated authority, the first suite of amendments um, to the Child Protection Act, um, they were up for it. So it was just like, well, let's just strike while the option is hot, let's push as hard as we can let's get these, um, you know, the legislative framework right, um, and then, you know, then we'll work towards implementation. And so um, that's, that's kind of how, it, how it's happening in, in Queensland. But um, that monitor, the, and I'm going to jump back to the child placement principle, but I think the other thing that's really, really important is that um, there was a really big effort under the last national framework, I think, to try and bring jurisdictions along to have some agreed measures, what does implementation of all five elements looks like? And, and I think that um, we were looking in the systems, in the data that they collect, thinking that somehow, miraculously, there was going to be this set um, that would match perfectly and tell us the story about whether a jurisdiction is implementing the child placement principle. Um, and, and, and I think that we've sort of hashed that out and over-engineered that to within, it, within an inch of its life. and so. Um, the approach that we've opted for um, in Queensland is to break it down for people and say, look, over-representation is, is a basic formula. It's about entry, duration and exit. And so these are the types of indicators. So we've nailed it into three entry um, indicators, three duration indicators and three exit ones. And so um, the important thing, being able to independently monitor that in our jurisdiction but then being able to disaggregate that down to a regional um, level and then when required to a local level. So when we're seeing shifts in entry, which is what we want to see, decline in entry, mm -hmm. we're able to actually weed through it and say, using those basic nine indicators to say, let's have a look in Charleville because something is happening there. 
and let's look, have a look in Rockhampton. What's making the difference there? And that's where we get to capture the things that are truly making a difference in addressing overrepresentation. Mm -hmm. And they're the things that all the researchers in the room that we need you to pay attention to and to get behind and to contribute to the building of an, of an evidence base that is about us, yes, but by us, yeah. that is actually about expressing mm -hmm. the efforts of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to address one of the most mm -hmm. critical social policy issues that has confounded governments for decades. So I think that, yeah, there's a real opportunity to keep an eye on that. Terrific. Thank, thank you for that. There's a question come through on the app after much pleading. Um, um, so the question is, what can AFES, peak bodies, individual organisations, etc., do to share examples or stories um, of better funding agreements, better research initiatives, etc., um, so that they stop be, being the exception and become the norm? You head up a peak body. I head up a peak body. Mm -hmm. a peak body. Um, look, we share our stories. We just share them. People want to hear about them. We had a webinar the other day. Uh, and, and look, I've been pushing the webinar really hard with the team. Look, people want to hear these stories. And uh, I, I got this really concerned phone call. And they said, oh, we've got a problem. And I said, what is it? And they said, we've got 2,000 registrations for the webinar. <laughs> and we can only take 800. <laughs> so um, there is an incredible thirst for this information. So if you have a platform, use it. Um, if you're having conversation with someone, use it. We're, we're seeing um, incredible support from our peers within both early childhood and um, um, child protection who will say, oh, there's a voice, there's a moment here where you can use your voice. So they'll put people like myself or a Nat in the room to speak to it uh, because it always works better if you've got an Aboriginal person speaking to what the issues are and what the solutions might be. But there are things like creating the space, uh, if you're a peak body, for those webinars where you get Aboriginal people in to talk about how you might change the way you work. There's also um, a number of resources that you can access. Snake has several of them on their website, so you can always check out our website, um, uh, that you can share with your peers. And these change the way that you approach practice and potentially even change the way you consider how you work with us. Because we've used that word partnership a lot, um, but it turns out a lot of those partnerships aren't really equal. So there are opportunities there to start challenging the way you understand working alongside Aboriginal people. But I'll throw it to Nat. Oh, you know, um, another shameless plug for Quasip. Um, <laughs> I know that they, um, you know, um, I don't want to let the cats out of bags, but it is mm -hmm. certainly within the, um, um, the forward plans of the organisation mm -hmm. um, around the establishment of a dedicated centre of excellence mm -hmm. that is focused on those innovations, mm -hmm. on those emerging and, and promising practices. Um, that are making a difference in the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and families. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that opportunity to showcase those, um, those things, mm -hmm. um, to broker partnerships with, um, you know, with universities and, and, mm -hmm. and researchers to actually um, have a real focus um, and commitment to building that evidence base. And mm -hmm. I just think that that, um, that is an initiative of a, you know, an Aboriginal peak body um, in Queensland and mm -hmm. um, they're going to have plenty of material to work with because, mm -hmm. yeah. They've got a pretty yeah. strong sector up there. Yeah, and amplifying that, of course, I'll just put it out there, was that commitment to the National Centre for, in, mm. for Excellence in the last budget. So it'd be nice if that happened, and it'd be nice if it was an Aboriginal peak body able to lead that. <laughs> one, of, one of the things we, um, at Access, we held our summit about last week, the week before, and one of the things we're leaning into in our role as a national institution is our, is to our convening power, creating a focus, uh, an opportunity for people to come together. It was the largest one we've had ever, kind of like this conference. I think this is the largest AFES conference ever because we're at a moment after two years of isolation and, and restricted movements where people are wanting to get together. So from my perspective, organisations like mine, are, uh, the, apart from our collection, the other most valuable thing we have, I think, is our ability to draw people together and create a forum for people to tell stories mm -hmm. and to tell their stories and to connect with other people who are doing work that they might not know about so people feel less isolated mm -hmm. and less alone in the work that they do. Mm -hmm. So um, 
and not that I was asked to answer the question, but I took the liberty anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> always good, always good. You know, I'm here, they've plugged me into this thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one more question from the app. Um, oh, I'll tell you. Uh, <laughs> I'm reading the question, and given the nature of the question, this is a question clearly to the both of you. Um, <laughs> what's your perspective on how fit for purpose family dispute resolution and family law services are for First Nations people? going through relationship breakdown. Uh, no, there's a subsequent uh, note, use of mainstream services is statistically low. Yeah, uh, look, with, with the general rule of thumb is Aboriginal people do not like to use mainstream services because we find them to be culturally unsafe. Um, I think, um, I, I, have, I have heard examples, um, largely coming out of South Australia, of some fantastic work that the ALRM then has been able to achieve, and in achieving those that work, it, it sort of it actually stopped things from hitting tertiary <coughs> intervention. So not only um, from people coming into contact with the justice system, but also the children in those relationships um, coming into contact with the child protection system. And again, this was a gap. So. Um, the legal service was able to pop into that, but it is it is always um, a really challenging conversation for those of us that work in the voice of children because we know that the legal system by default doesn't necessarily isn't necessarily the best vehicle to carry the voices of our children. Um, it's an it's an unfriendly system. It's a it's um, sometimes very biased, even <coughs> despite the best work. And and again, you know, sometimes it's hard to be positive about these things because you think about things like, you know, if we talk about, um, you know, say what we saw in the Territory recently with um, young Kumin Jai Walker, um, that was a kid who'd had a really tough life, really tough life, and uh, we all know what the outcome was, but we still sit in a, a system where um, you can have juries which built on you know, good intent, right? Good intent, just not fit for purpose for our mob where you come off the electoral roll. So that's one thing, not a lot of our mob are enrolled, but it doesn't speak to, do you have people in those rooms that um, are familiar with the context of that environment? Do you have anyone that's Aboriginal in those rooms and being able to solve these problems and to bring in the perspective and the voice? Um, so the, there, are, there are some inherent problems and there are some inherent problems um, in people being fearful of the justice system. We see a lot of success where those things can be dealt with really early um, by, you know, Victoria has, again, as, as Nat spoke to, Victoria's got some incredible um, data coming around um, their intervention services like um, Noogle, which work with the family so that they don't actually have to get to that point and it's removed from the legal service. Um, there's, I know there's work being done to try and make some of those legal frameworks more culturally competent and, and I know that our legal services try really, really hard, right? This is, this is tough work, this is tough work and these are laws, again, that weren't built for us. Um, but it's, I, I'd like to say that there's a really easy answer uh, or a really easy silver bullet. What I know is all these things are nuanced and um, it's why we, we fight for community controlled organisations because they know, their, their communities tell them what they need. Their communities tell them if it's working. Their communities tell them to adjust their practice. And in turn, then those organisations are able to use bodies like their peaks to say, this would be a lot easier if the funding parameters were moved or if the legislation was moved or if the policy was moved. Um, that wasn't a really straightforward answer, but Nat, you're a clearer <laughs> thinker than me. No, I, I mean, I was just, um, you know, like, um, and while it might not have evolved as a, a process that, you know, with the family law court in mind, mm -hmm. um, you know, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander family led decision making models, mm -hmm. um, you know, that are, you know, in some places being trialled, but in some parts of the country have been rolled out statewide. I think it's really important to, um, to understand that the, the dynamic that's created, the safety that's created mm -hmm. for people to speak openly and, and freely. Um, I think the learnings from the family-led decision-making trials in the child protection context um, offer a lot to other areas of, um, of social policy mm -hmm. that, you know, that require people being positioned mm -hmm. to have a, have a say in the things that most profoundly affect their families. So. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Well, look, on that note, 
and I pressed a button and buggered up the app so <laughs> no <one> else is. <laughs> and uh, I tried to refresh so many times but you can only do that before you kind of give it up right um, uh, so I'm going to ask you to join me in thanking our two wonderful presenters